Hello everyone, this is a patron-only installment of Historian Splaining, and this will be number 12 in our series on the history of the United States in 100 objects, and this one is on a wooden bowling ball from Boston, Massachusetts from the late 1600s. So just to describe the thing itself, it technically could be called a lawn bowl, B-O-W-L-E, because it is technically not a bowling ball like we would know today, which should be perfectly spherical. Instead, it is slightly flattened in shape, almost disc-like, and this means it's of the type that often used to be used in lawn bowling, so games similar to what today we might call bocce or pétanque where you try to place balls in a certain configuration on a turf. And this particular lawn bowl was found in the back lot behind a house on Ann Street, now known as North Street, in the north end of Boston, during excavations there in 1992, carried out by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. The bowling ball is made of lathe-turned oak wood, probably was crafted between about 1670 and 1690, and hence it can confidently be called the oldest bowling ball in America. And as I said, it has a flattened, somewhat wheel-like shape with a hole drilled into the central axis in which apparently there used to be a lead weight, which made it uneven and hence easier to add spin so that it can be curved or its pathway can be manipulated in very fine ways. And we know that lawn bowling balls were used in this sort of way from a 1615 English book called Country Contentments, which describes various games and sports and says about lawn bowling, quote, in this sport, the choosing of the bowl is the greatest cunning, your flat bowls being the best for close allies. And that phrase close allies probably means when a player aims to land a piece very close to other targets, most likely their opponents. So probably this particular bowling ball was created and shaped and crafted to be used by very sophisticated players of this game. So what's the big deal about this lawn bowl? Why is it so historically significant? Well, to begin with, it's significant because of the site where it was found and who probably owned it. And we actually happen to know a great deal about the person who probably owned and used this bowling ball. We don't know who made it. It could have been any number of carpenters, shipbuilders, house builders. But it was found, as I mentioned, in 1992 at an archaeological site commonly called the Cross Street Backlot Site. And this is the small backyard, enclosed backyard behind this house, surrounding a privy or outhouse. Privies or outhouses tend to be good archaeological sites because they tend to have a lot of trash and discarded items piled up around them or in them, in the actual latrine. And this one on Ann Street, now called North Street, was particularly rich in finds. All sorts of shoes and boots, pieces of jewelry, buckles from clothing and shoes, imported pottery, and even pieces of silk and lace textiles, which are very rare to find in the early colonies, were all uncovered around this back lot. And the house behind which it's situated was owned by a woman named Catherine Nanny Naylor who was a fairly notorious person, it seems, in colonial Boston, and who left behind a very interesting paper trail and legacy. So Catherine Nanny Naylor was born in a small village in Lincolnshire, England, in 1630. So right in that region of England, in the east-central part of the country, that was strong in Puritanism. She was the daughter of a Puritan minister named John Wheelwright, 
who took the entire family with him to New England in 1636, right in the height of that great migration when thousands of Puritans are moving across the ocean to create the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it seems that John Wheelwright was very pious and zealous in the faith, and very soon after settling in the Massachusetts colony, he became a supporter of Anne Hutchinson. And Anne Hutchinson happened to be his own wife's sister-in-law, so they were connected by marriage. And he spoke out in defense of Anne Hutchinson's views and preachings, which were controversial in colonial Boston. And hence, only two years after the family arrived in Massachusetts, he was banished from the colony in 1638. So he again took the family out on the road, and they went first to New Hampshire, where Wheelwright became one of the main founders of the town of Exeter in New Hampshire, then to Maine, before eventually returning to Massachusetts Bay where most of the family, including Catherine, then settled for the rest of their lives. But Wheelwright himself ultimately retired back to England, as many Puritan colonists did, and he became a close friend and supporter of Oliver Cromwell. So he was a very controversial firebrand figure in his own life, and one of his daughters was Catherine, whom we mentioned. So when Catherine was 20 years old in 1650, she married a prosperous merchant in Boston named Robert Nanny, and together they raised eight children in their house on Ann Street, which was a not unusual number of children to have in the 1600s. However, in 1663, when she's still only 33 years old, her husband Robert Nanny dies. And this leaves her in a difficult position of having to support herself and some young children without a husband. So it was hard enough for a woman to survive in a colony, even absent young children. So not long after the death of Robert Nanny, she remarried to another merchant named Edward Naylor. And she and Edward Naylor had two daughters. But this marriage evidently was abusive. And according to later court documents and eyewitnesses, he was very violent. He threw objects at his wife, struck his wife, sometimes pushed children around the house or even downstairs. And after years of bitter conflict, he evidently abandoned the family and ran off with a pregnant servant woman. So in 1671, after eight years of this very unhappy marriage, Catherine successfully sued for divorce. The court found in her favor, and not only that, but the jury immediately banished Edward Naylor from the town of Boston and surrounding areas. Now, fortunately, after this divorce, she evidently was able to function as a self-sufficient woman women sometimes plied trades like tailoring and the needle trades, and one way or another, she was able to keep herself financially stable. The house technically passed to the possession of her children, who inherited it upon the death of the husband, but she outlived all of her children into old age, and ownership of the house on Ann Street reverted back to her. And she lived there until she died at the age of 85 in 1716. So she had lived a pretty remarkable, unusual, and probably in some ways controversial life as a self-supporting woman, as a divorced woman, and had seen that transition all the way from the Puritan age into the 18th century. Both her marriages and her own business pursuits evidently provided her with a good deal of wealth. And in searching around the privy, all sorts of exotic items that probably were very expensive, such as imported Spanish pottery and pits from imported Spanish olives, rice from Madagascar, small bits of Venetian glass, were all found in that back lot. So she was probably living not only a comfortable life, but a materially fairly extravagant life for the very restrained tastes and norms 
of colonial Boston. And also among those things found in the back lot is this bowling ball, which probably it seems was used for a while. It shows certain kinds of wear and then probably was discarded, maybe in the privy itself or nearby, because it was missing certain parts. So as I said, there clearly was a lead weight inserted into the hole in the center of the bowling ball in order to give it extra weight and asymmetry. And probably that drilled hole also was covered over by some sort of shell or ceramic plug to keep the weight inside. But when the bowling ball was discovered, both of those parts were gone and nowhere to be found. So probably the bowling ball had simply outlived its usability and hence was discarded. Now, out of all the things found in Catherine Nanny Naylor's back lot, why is this lawn bowling ball particularly important and revealing? Well, lawn bowling was heavily discouraged and suppressed in the Puritan colonies. And specifically in 1650, the Massachusetts Bay Colony Assembly banned bowling of any kind in taverns or public houses because supposedly it was seen as encouraging gambling, almost any sort of small indoor sport. You know, not only dice and cards, but even lawn bowling could be used as a basis for gambling. Yet we know that it was played after 1652 at Catherine's home or somewhere nearby because the privy in which it was found was designed and had dimensions to conform to standards set out in a 1652 law. So that means that some kind of lawn bowling was going on even after it had been proclaimed illegal in public houses. So either she was doing this illegally or hosting it illegally, or she was doing it sort of covertly in a private setting where it wasn't allowed in public. So this was nonetheless, even if it was technically legal, it was definitely a taboo game. And this taboo didn't relax until about the 1710s, when there start to be early references to lawn bowling happening in taverns and public houses, despite the ban. So in this in-between period, between 1650 and about 1710, the taboo was clearest and strongest, and yet it was going on at Catherine Nanny Naylor's house. Probably that was because it could be tolerated in private settings among people who were seen to have low respectability or low reputation. And maybe that included Catherine, who was a divorced woman, and a divorced woman who evidently made no move to remarry after her divorce. And this unusual incident in Catherine's life that she obtained a divorce probably added on to already existing suspicions or bad associations around her, considering that her father was a known heretic who had also had to be banned from the colony decades earlier. So what does it matter? Who cares that lawn bowling was happening at her home? Well, in this way, the game and the artifact fit into a continuing history of struggle, a futile struggle, to exert social control and conformity in the New England colonies. So the early colonizers, both in the Plymouth colony in 1620 and then in the Massachusetts Bay colony, the Puritan colonists in the 1630s, both of them brought with them very strict ideals and a, an image of correct family, church, and town life which was based to some degree upon certain towns and villages in Eastern England, which were heavily Puritan, and also on the Swiss Reformed Protestant cities, especially Geneva, which was a kind of strictly controlled Protestant utopia under the domination of John Calvin. So they brought with them these ideas of what they wanted 
a Protestant society in America to look like, but it was very rarely actually realized. All kinds of complications came over the ocean with them or appeared in their interactions with the Native Americans. So this constant rearguard struggle goes all the way back to the beginning of Plymouth, which tried to suppress what they considered vices, violations of church discipline and law and morality, like drunkenness, swearing, open displays of the body or sex, fraternization with indigenous Americans, and a whole host of customs that were derived from older pagan festivals and observances, things like celebrations of May Day and even Christmas, which was banned both in Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay. And if we look just at Plymouth Colony in the 1620s, this led right away to splits and resistance. And a minister of the Plymouth Colony even, named Thomas Morton, seceded from Plymouth and took a bunch of his own European colonial followers and friendly indigenous Americans out northward in 1625 up into the area that's now Quincy, Massachusetts, and created a separate town which came to be known as Marymount. And Marymount became a haven for all the sorts of activities that Plymouth tried to suppress, like expressions of sexuality, dancing, music, and particularly they became infamous when they erected an enormous maypole at the center of town on May Day. And May Day had been associated for centuries with quasi-pagan celebration of nature, spring, and sex. Going and finding partners and having sex out in nature was one of the customary practices on May Day. So naturally, this maypole particularly scandalized and horrified the Plymouth colonists and eventually provoked them to invade and destroy Marymount. But just a few years later, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was created right around that area, around what had been Marymount. And this colony had the same sorts of struggles and schisms. There was a struggle to suppress political dissent and religious dissent, what most of the ministers considered to be heresy. And this led to the expulsion first of Roger Williams, who went and helped to create the Providence Plantations Colony, and then Anne Hutchinson and John Wheelwright and others who went some northward to New Hampshire, some southward into what's now Rhode Island. And the colony tried to reinforce this social control and conformity within its own bounds through sumptuary laws regulating who could wear what clothes, Sabbath laws, against work or drinking on the Sunday Sabbath, and even laws prohibiting anyone from living more than a certain distance, like one mile, out of the town center. So this was a way to ensure a degree of security for each town, but also a way to keep monitoring and controlling the inhabitants by not letting anyone go off and strike out on their own. But nonetheless, despite all of these laws and rules, all of these activities continued, often in private. Things like sorcery and divination, adultery, displays of sexuality, gambling, all of these things went on and kept having to be sort of rooted out and suppressed over and over. And archaeology is showing how extensive and pervasive some of these practices were. For instance, recent archaeology has found many, many instances of remains of cats laid underneath the thresholds of houses and taverns, and it seems that at least some of them were actually intentionally killed as some kind of sacrifice to then be put under the doorway of a new building as a way of protecting it, perhaps warding off uh, evil spirits in the way that a living cat wards off mice and rats. So there was this kind of continuing stream of magical beliefs of some sort or another that clearly would not fit 
and would not meet the approval of Reformed Protestant ministers if they knew about it. So all of these taboo activities, it seems in the 1600s, could cluster around socially marginal people. People like single women, divorced women, people with heretical views, individuals like Catherine Nanny Naylor, for instance, who then sometimes, in some instances, might end up being accused of witchcraft, as of course happened in Salem in 1692. But even without that, these individuals could sort of attract these taboo activities, and eventually, as these towns grew and became big commercial entrepots in the 1700s, not only individual people in their households, but whole neighborhoods could form that served as refuges for disreputable people and activities. And so it shouldn't be surprising then that Ann Street, this little street in the North End, where Catherine lived until she died in 1716, eventually developed into a red light district, which housed about half of all the known brothels in colonial Massachusetts, and continued then to be a red light district all the way on up through to the 19th century. Did that development have anything to do with Catherine herself or with the things like lawn bowling that went on within her household. Uh, we don't have a, enough records to know, but it could stand to reason. It's the sort of thing that happens as neighborhoods grow. A tiny seed, a tiny element can end up influencing the entire character of a whole neighborhood or a whole town. So in that way, there's huge social significance, a whole other side, you could say, of colonial life, even in Puritan Boston, that is suggested by this one wooden bowling ball. <laughs>